Straight ahead on CCX News, a gun shop burglarized in Robbinsdale, and police call this kind of crime extremely rare. Plus, school growth in the Wyzetta District leads to more attendance boundary changes proposed. And... This Cody is a piece of Robbinsdale, and it's uh, residents should come out and enjoy it. Celebrating 125 years in Robbinsdale, CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Police are investigating two gun shop burglaries, including one in Robbinsdale. The police say thieves took extreme measures to get into the Robbinsdale store. We get more from Eric Nelson. Eric? Yes, Alex and Mike, this bold break-in happened last Friday around 3.15 a.m. at Bill's Gun Shop in Robbinsdale. The gun thieves took a small amount of weapons and they are still at large. Police have little to go on at this time and don't know the thieves' motivation. But they do know that the suspects repeatedly rammed the entrance to the gun shop with their car to gain access to the building. Unfortunately, at this point, the information is quite limited. Um, we just have the silver Chevy Aveo as a suspect vehicle, which should have extensive front end damage. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that vehicle has not been located at this point in time. Surveillance video shows at least two people involved in the gun grab, but there are no descriptions because they were wearing masks. There is noticeable damage to the entrance of Bill's gun shop. This is the first break in there since it opened 31 years ago. This kind of burglary where a car rams a door to create an entrance is very rare. I wouldn't describe it as common, um, just given the fact that it makes a good deal of noise. And even though this was at 3.30 in the morning, I mean, there's still people out. Um, so I would describe it as a relatively rare occurrence just for the fact that it's going to draw attention to what the individuals are doing. Plus, you know, you throw in the mix knowledge of, uh, of a security system. Now, Robbinsdale police don't believe there is any connection to the gun heist at a store in Minnetonka, which also occurred early Friday morning. Alex and Mike. All right, thanks a lot, Eric. Local school districts are bracing for what could be one of the biggest budget deficits in years. And the problem is not enough state aid to cover the growing cost of special education. That's forcing the districts to make up the difference out of funds that usually pay for general classroom instruction. School officials hope the legislature will approve an increase for special education. These are important services, and nobody argues that the school districts should not be providing these important special education services because our students need them. Um, but the problem, of course, is, is that when the state and federal governments do not provide the funding, you create a real budget nightmare for school districts. According to a budget survey, Osseo schools may see a shortfall of more than $5 million. Anoka Hennepin could be more than $2 million in the red. And in the Robbinsdale School District, it could be $10.5 million. That could mean laying off about 70 people. Board Chair John Vento says they're trying to keep most of the cuts away from classrooms. We're cutting about 13 to 14 percent out of our central office and only about two and a half to 2.6 percent that will be in the school sites. So we're really doing the best effort to prevent the, the effect in our classrooms um, and those frontline staff members. But overall, you know, as again, as I said, is with a $10 million shortfall, everything's got to be put on the table. Vento says they are asking staff to suggest ways to make less painful cuts and a budget should be finalized by June 30th. With a growing population in Plymouth and a new elementary school on the way, the Wyzetta School District is drawing up plans to reshape school boundaries. It's not an easy task. If it was easy, it wouldn't require much time. But trying to balance proximity to a school, um, who can walk, who can't walk, having contiguous boundaries, all those types of things, it's actually much more complex than one would think. Wyzetta's ninth elementary school will open in the fall of 2019 on the northwest side of Plymouth. Dozens of new homes are under construction in that area. A 24-person committee worked for several months to come up with a plan to reconfigure the boundaries. District officials say this reconfiguration will impact fewer students than when they went through this process three years ago. But the committee still had to make some tough choices. Nobody raises their hand, you know, and says, please move us. I mean, nobody wants to move. It's a difficult thing because you build those strong relationships and friends and people that have volunteered and donated their time. Um, so definitely there'll be some of those difficult situations. 
The school board will host a public input session at Central Middle School on May 2nd at 7 p.m. The board plans to make its final vote on the boundary changes on May 14th. In New Hope, construction of a new city hall and police station has taken a slightly more expensive turn. The site of the former swimming pool was chosen for the new complex because it was thought that location would have better soil conditions. Well, it turns out poor soils on the eastern portion of the site will make the project a little more costly, an extra $76,000. It's a small price considering the total cost is nearly $15 million. The project also won't be delayed because of the soil discovery which requires a different construction method for the foundation. The new building is expected to be ready next summer. A local Hennepin County Commissioner is trying to ease concerns about the Botno Light Rail project. Officials from Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway sent a letter to the Met Council last week saying the company is not interested in sharing its rail corridor. BNSF sent them a similar letter back in January. Plans for the Botno line connecting Brooklyn Park to downtown Minneapolis call for light rail tracks to be built right next to tracks carrying BNSF trains. Hennepin County Commissioner Commissioner Mike Opat says the railroad's reaction is disappointing, but they still hope to work out a deal. Well, I think we'll continue to try to engage them. Um, this is too important a project to stop. We're certainly not going to stop. We have a good alignment. Uh, the alignment includes the rail corridor. Again, there's plenty of room in that wide uh, corridor, and it's not a very busy freight line anyway. So all those things keep us um, attempting to talk to them, and we'll probably have to get some advocates uh, to help us do that. The Metropolitan Council needs an agreement with BNSF to help secure funding for the Botno line from the federal government. Still ahead on CCX News, we go inside a Plymouth women's business and experience glamorous Indian fashions. Plus, it's a big night for a few local track and field stars at the Hamlin Elite Meet. That's later in sports. But first, rain possible on Tuesday evening, highs in the 70s. We'll be right back. In May, a Plymouth entrepreneur will be one of 47 women honored by the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal for their contributions. And Neela Chakraborty saw a need in the marketplace. And in this week's Business Matters, we show you how her online business continues to meet the demand. From the outside of this Plymouth home, you would never guess. This product is unique because there's only one of each product that's stitched because it's all hand stitched. How close you are to the South Asian glamour. We will see Bollywood actresses wearing these big kundan earrings. Of Bollywood style. You can't go back to India all the time, so we try to bring Bollywood to you. From the basement of her home. We have a Kashmiri jacket. This is made in Kashmir. Neela Chakraborty has created shopbollywear.com an online fashion business that brings the special occasion saris and other Bollywood wares to doorsteps around the country. During big festivals like Diwali, Holi, Navaratri, Eid is coming up, this is where you would wear these products. You know, the big festival seasons are coming up. Neela launched her business two years ago after seeing others struggle to find Indian fashions in her previous work as a wedding planner. This is from Lucknow, Chikan, it's northern India. Colorful, hand Stitch saris, six yards of fabric that's draped around the body, can sell on Neela's site for up to $200. With about five to ten other employees, Neela also works with curators in India that go directly to the weavers and manufacturers to specify designs and colors. And that assures a level of quality that is earning Neela many customers. When you wear a beautiful sari like this to a wedding, you're probably not going to repeat it and wear it again to the next special event. And that's the idea behind Neela's next business. It's not like you can take these products and go to Goodwill and they'll be bought or donated by Goodwill. So we thought of tradebollywear.com where you can go and sell and buy your own products there. Think of it like an eBay or Craigslist for Indian fashions. Tradebollywear.com is Neela's next business venture coming this fall. It's a two-way street for the consumer and the seller, you know, to buy and to sell the product. So it's a win-win for everyone. Neela's businesses cover both women's, men's, and kids' fashions, as well as jewelry and accessories. 
Still ahead, a day of celebration in Robbinsdale that involves trees, trash, and a cootie. But first, a former Maple Grove football standout is set to sign with the Vikings. John Jacobson has that coming up next. I'm John Jacobson with sports. Maple Grove's Jake Winicky wasn't selected in the NFL draft that ended Saturday, but that was okay with the former Crimson and South Dakota State wide receiver. That's because the Minnesota Vikings made him a rookie free agent signing after the final round of the draft. We caught up with Jake earlier today. Uh, it was pretty special just uh, celebrating with my family. So I got the call during the draft. There's about five picks left and uh, it was Coach Hazel, the uh, wide receiver coach for the Vikings, and said, hey, if you don't get drafted in the last couple picks, um, do you want to be a Viking? I was like, yes, sir. And it was kind of just uh, didn't even seem like it was real. And then uh, kind of the last five picks, I was just hoping, I was like, I right, hope somebody else doesn't pick me. Um, and then when the, when the draft ended, just kind of just celebrated with my family, just knowing that I'd be a Viking. Uh, it was a pretty special feeling. So I was a Vikings fan uh, my whole life, uh, watching Randy Moss, Chris Carter, all those guys, now Adam Thielen, and now to be a part of that team, I mean, it's just so special. I'm just pretty surreal still, but um, I'm just really, really excited for it, really looking forward to being a Viking. How have you slept the last couple of nights? Uh, pretty good. I've actually been dreaming a lot about uh, being a Viking and um, going to training camp, just different things. I uh, had a lot of dreams about about football, so it's been, it's been pretty cool. <laughs> Adam Thielen was an undrafted rookie free agent a few years ago. Also wears number 19. Have you, have you talked to him? Yeah, he texted me right away. Um, and I was pretty special just getting a text from him and uh, just, just knowing that I'm about to be on his team and, and get to learn from him and, and just watch him work in person will be, will be a lot of fun. So, Rookie mini camp comes up this week. And what have they told you about uh, what you're going to be doing over those three days? So, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Uh, Thursday, I report, I sign and uh, start uh, rookie mini camp. I think we'll have four practices in three days and, and just go out there and just compete with a bunch of other uh, rookies and, and kind of show what we can do. Have you heard from a lot of former high school teammates, college teammates <laughs> after you got signed? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I've never, I've never had that many texts on my phone. I had over 100 texts. I had to, I was staying up to like midnight just replying to texts. I mean, it, it took a while, but it was pretty cool just seeing how people were supporting me and encouraging me and just kind of following me. So, I mean, it was just, it was pretty awesome to, to hear back from them and, and even talk to them a couple times throughout yesterday and even today, just kind of with some people I haven't, haven't talked to for a while. The rookie mini camp starts Friday at the Vikings new training facility in Egan. Friday night marked a yearly highlight of the early season in track and field. Because of the late start this spring, standards for qualifying for the Hamlin Elite Meet were relaxed this year. State's best meeting in St. Paul for one night. Boys 4 by 200 relay, the Hopkins team of Jalen champion Sam Learbig, King Alla, and anchor Joe Fonbele set a new meet record with a time of 1 minute 27.29 seconds. Girls 100 hurdles, Maple Grove's Heather Ryan a close second to Rosemont's Shea Buckman. Girls 4 by 800 meters, Minnetonka takes first with Wyzetta's Caroline Sasson anchoring Wyzetta to a second place finish. In the boys long jump, Wyzetta sophomore Dante White takes second place with the best jump of 21 feet 9 and a half inches. Boys 200, it's Fonbele rumbling to gold again, Maple Grove's Evan Hull is fifth. Boys 300 hurdles, a great race for Osseo's Tyler Seelock. He beats the reigning state champion, among others. He takes first with a time of 38.42 seconds. Here's what two local winners had to say after their races. My goal is to make this meet. This is the top competition you'll ever get before sections or state. Especially our section, we got tough Joel, Josh, and any other covers, like you never know will pop up. So I was really happy how I performed here. We knew about breaking the record last year. We set our goals on it this year, three months in the gym, day in, day out. So we came out here and we just did that. We set the elite meet record. The Heritage Christian Academy baseball team is off to a strong start. The Eagles should contend for the MCAA conference title this spring. They hosted Maranatha last Friday. Bottom of the first inning, Heritage's Taylor Broderson singles past third base. P.J. Guggenberger scores. It's 2-0 Eagles. 
They score four in the inning. Heritage senior Seth Halverson Dobbin on the mound. Strikes out seven of the Mustangs' first eight batters. Eagles score a handful of runs on wild pitches, including Johnny Flynn coming home here in the third inning. Caden Richards laces a third inning single in the left field for a hit. Zach Richards scores. Heritage scores 15 runs in the third inning. They go on to Blank Maranatha 20 to nothing in five. Eagles have won four straight games. That's all for sports. Mike and Alex, back to you. All right, John, thank you. Up next, celebrating 125 years in Robbinsdale. Why this celebration involved more than just honoring a city. We'll be right back. A celebration over the weekend in Robbinsdale had double purpose. And not only did the city celebrate Arbor Day, but they also capped off their 125th anniversary celebration. Reporter Shannon Slatton explains what they did. It should be a good time for everybody to come out, enjoy the beautiful day, meet their neighbors. On one of the first days of the season where it actually felt like spring, Robbinsdale residents came together to plant a tree near City Hall. I picked a uh, tree called the Swamp White Oak. City forester Stefan Pappas says if you want to plant a tree for Arbor Day, try to increase tree diversity in Robbinsdale by skipping the maples and lindens. So we plant honey locust, Kentucky coffee tree, all sorts of different oaks oaks, even uh, sycamores and hackberries. Residents could not only pick up some of those diverse trees to plant, but they could pick up trash in local parks. We adopted uh, the Sunset Park and Lakeview Terrace Park. Manuel's Church is one of 14 groups who take responsibility for picking up trash in a park through the Adopt-a-Park program. And clean and green, actually, clean and green activity. This year we have 14 groups that are volunteering to go out and clean up our parks. And we ask them to do that three times during the season from spring through fall. Tom Marshall says the city provides gloves and bags, while volunteers provide positive feedback about a worthwhile way to give back. There's such a feeling of accomplishment that comes from that. I've heard that time and time again. And finally, not far from everyone's mind, is the cootie. Just a small part of Robbinsdale's 125th anniversary. The cootie sculpture held court at Lakeview Terrace Pavilion for the day. Yeah, it's become quite popular in social media. It's been spreading through Facebook with people taking pictures of it with their children or them, adults with themselves. Um, so that's exciting to see. We encourage residents to do that and share it. It's, it's, a, it's a, This cootie is a piece of Robbinsdale, and it's uh, residents should come out and enjoy it. In Robbinsdale, Shannon Slatton, CCX News. And if you want to adopt a park, you are in luck. There are two parks currently up for grabs. As for the cootie, there's no word yet on where the sculpture will be permanently installed. I kind of like that idea of the traveling cootie. You can take pictures in different right. Robbinsdale locations. That's right. nice. Very good. <laughs> that does it for us. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here again Tuesday, and we will start at 4.